Hello Bible study students. I'm recording this on Wednesday, May 13th, and it is the 11th session in our study of 1 Corinthians, and today we focus on chapter 11. If you've not been with us before, it's handy to have your Bible near at hand. I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version, so you may have it may be the same as yours or there may be differences. For the past three weeks, we've been working on one issue. That it, It's an issue that was brought to Paul by some of the leaders of the congregation in Corinth, and it has to do with whether it is acceptable or prohibited to eat meat that has been offered to idols. So Paul has used three separate arguments to deal with this troublesome issue within the church. In chapter 8, Paul argued that those who were strong and secure in their faith should provide a good example to those who were weaker or newer to faith, since these folks may easily fall back into the idol worship from which they came. In chapter 9, Paul uses his own approach of surrendering his rights and options in order to protect those who have a weaker sense of faith, suggesting that spiritual entitlement and all that goes with it, which is being exhibited by the, quote, strong in faith, that these folks should do as Paul does and relinquish such rights and options. Finally, in chapter 10, Paul concluded the whole set of arguments by making a case against all forms of idol worship, including meat that is purchased in the markets that was previously offered to idols. Because by such involvement, Christians could actually put themselves at spiritual per peril. As Paul had considered this issue, he took great care not to simply give a rule and demand an enforcement or obedience to that rule. Rather, he wrote from a pastoral heart about the various implications the questionable practice provoked, especially among the weaker of the newer to the faith members of the congregation. Paul was also aware that the wealthier and more spiritually enlightened were failing to consider the needs of these newer, poorer members. All his carefully arranged arguments eventually returned to the same issue of unity and cohesiveness within the church in Corinth. Now, as we open chapter 11, we're going to, we're actually beginning another section that will cover five chapters, and all of this will be devoted to the purpose and practice of worship within the early church. Also, the focus will continue to be on unity and cohesiveness. But before we begin, let us pray. Holy God, we ask you to be with us as we open your word today. May it be that as our imaginations are stirred, that our hearts and our will will also be raised up. We thank you for the gift to be able to look into another culture and yet the ability to see in the otherness something that feels very familiar in our contemporary culture. So bless us in our work and may these words be a means of building up our faith and joining us together in unity. In Jesus' name we pray. It may be helpful to remind ourselves a little bit about the nature and style of first century church, especially in this current time of possible reopening of the church it helps us, it should encourage us, that in the first century, all worship either took place in a home or out of doors. 
most communities included at least one individual with a home sufficiently large enough to host a gathering of about 40. There was ordinarily a separate dining room that would accommodate between eight and 10 individuals. And normally this is where the immediate family gathered their, for their meals. But often households were quite large and included up to 20 or 30 other individuals besides the immediate family as homes were also work sites where business, crafts, and labor was conducted. Extended families often lived and worked together and those who dined in that special dining room could shift from meal to meal depending on their schedule of work for the day and the needs of the entire community. The dining room had ample access, usually a full wall of an opening to the central courtyard. Now the fare for the meals was simple, two meals a day, each consisting of a large quantity of bread, but also fruit, fresh or dried, curds and cheese, eggs, yogurt, honey, olives, stewed beans, vegetables, fish, and on festive occasions only, roasted meat. This food was prepared in the central courtyard and available for extended periods of time in the morning and at the, after the day's labor was concluded. As the family members gathered, they ate, in, filter, in came the laborers and the slaves according to their own schedules. In the summertime, the courtyard side benches, something like bancos, were in the shade. And in the winter, rugs covered the ground near the cooking and the warming fires. Now, when such a home became a worship site, rugs were set out in the central courtyard for the community to sit on. In conjunction with the worship, a meal was shared, referred to as the Lord's Meal, to all the 30 or 40 participants. The worship included the sing-song chanting of the scripture with congregational refrains, the particularly, particularly using the Psalms, spontaneous testimonies to God's presence and power in the lives of individuals with an emphasis on conversion, healing, and protection. Then there would be a central testimony or teaching, or perhaps you'd call it a sermon, on Jesus and his teachings, and that would be delivered by the elder in charge of the community Occasionally, there would be a ev visiting evangelist might be present and offer this teaching, or a letter from the founding pastor would be read or reread. Prayers would intersperse the entire service, and some were formal, and some were spontaneous, and some were ecstatic utterances in song or tongues or trance-like metaphoric prayer. Hymns to Christ were in circulation among regional churches and members were always encouraged to greet one another with a kiss. During Paul's time, the Sunday service also included the shared meal and this meal would later become the Eucharist. But in Paul's time, the remembrance meal was not a sacrament. That elevation was still under development. Also, for the church in Paul's time, education happened within the common gathering or worship. The meal was integrated towards the end, so everything led up to the meal. Later, when the meal had been instituted as a worship practice, the newer believers were dismissed during the Eucharist. They went off for education in the essential truths that would become the doctrine and the creeds of the church. These members-to-be would gather in a room removed from the central courtyard, perhaps a workshop or the sleeping room. 
Now in this particular chapter 11, we're going to be discussing some of the problems that Paul wants to address in the worship within the church in Corinth. Some of these issues come from the concerns directed by the leaders. These verses Paul addresses at the very beginning. And then he moves from the particular to a more universal concern over the meal. A meal that Paul is intentionally shaping as the central formative activity of the community. Now I have to pause here for a little aside. Some of the material in chapter 11 has been used in manipulative ways to undercut the participation of women in the fullest expressions of church life, specifically leadership in worship. Once again, there are contextual issues that must be considered, but sadly, we do not know the exact nature of the concerns that have been raised by the Corinthian leaders. However, we can use the full range of Paul's teachings, the general cultural information that's available to us, and our sensitivity to Paul's overarching aim in all his arguments, that being the unity of the church and women. This section may rile you up a bit, so keep your outrage in check. There are places where Paul's logical reasoning overwhelms his theological and pastoral responsibilities. And at points, he can't decide whether to be gospel-oriented or culturally adaptive. So here's the flow of chapter 11. Verses 2 through 6 is a convoluted discussion of appropriate hairstyles for worship with an emphasis on gender distinction between men and women. 17 and 22 address a larger issue of divisions within the community and it's pretty clear that these divisions fall along the line of rich and poor. 23 to 26 is a proclamation of the significance of the Lord's Supper, namely a remembrance of the Lord's death. And 27 to 34 Paul issues a call to the body of Christ in the meal and in the community. The, con the congregation is to discern Christ's body in the meal and in their gathering. So, here we go with section 1, verses 2 through 16. I said before, it's convoluted, and it is. The question to put to Paul is unknown. But here's a suggestion. It is possible that some women in Corinth were enjoying the freedom to participate fully in worship and that they have decided to remove their headbands, literally to let their hair down. Now the Corinthian leaders understood these gestures to be signs of the women's equality with men in worship. And the leaders assumed that Paul would welcome the enactment of no longer male or female in Christ. But here's Paul's response. Four things before we get into the verses. Paul endorsed the freedom of women to pray and prophesy in the assembly. He is concerned, however, about their loose hair. He prefers that women's hair look like women's hair and men's hair look like men's hair and that each, the woman and the man, recognize their status as created by God and intended for full participation in Christ. Point number two. There is a, pa a patriarchal order expressed in verses 3 and 7 and 9. 
but this is set in counterpoint with a vision of mutual interdependence between men and women in the Lord. Point number three, the passage does not require the subordination of women. It simply presents a symbolic distinction between the sexes according to their relationship to one another and, of all things, to their hairstyles, long or short, bound up or free of coverings. The immediate concern of the passage is for the Corinthians to avoid anything that might bring shame upon the community. Uh, in other words, Paul does not want the worship to appear to outsiders as something less than Christ's own presence in the world. And remember, Christ's own presence in the world was humble, not puffed up, not ecstatic, not overly sensational. Now there's a few other linguistic issues. First, the word for veil or head covering does not occur in the Greek text. The original Greek speaks only of covered or uncovered. And indeed, it, it may be that we are not speaking of the traditional head covering that would have been worn by a Jewish woman, but not by Gentile women, but rather speaking of the binding up of hair, think bands or ribbons, as opposed to loose flowing hair. Loose flowing hair was a traditional fashion for prostitutes and for the ecstatic oracle speakers in the pagan temples. There are a couple other linguistic subplots. For example, Greek does not have a word for husband and wife. So whenever you read husband and wife, in context, Greek should be interpreted first as man or woman, and then if the context demands it, as husband and wife. So in this case, the generic term man and woman are probably preferable to the NRSV husband and wife. Listen for that. And then there's that word head, which could be translated often as a metaphor for source or for authority. Source as in the source of one's being, authority as in the range of expression, the range of participation, the range of occupancy. So listen to the text, and after hearing it, we'll go into it a little more. I'm reading from the second verse through the 16th. Paul speaks to the church. I commend you, mean church, because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions just as I handed them on to you. But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man and the husband is the head of his wife and God is the head of Christ. Any man who prays or prophesies with something on his head disgraces his head. But any woman who prays or prophesies with her head unveiled, uncovered, disgraces her head. It is one and the same thing as having her head shaved. For if a woman will not veil herself, then she should cut off her hair. But if it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or be shaved, she should wear a veil. For a man ought not to have his head veiled, since a man is in the image and the reflection of God. But a woman is the reflection of man. Indeed, man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither a man created for the sake of a woman, neither was man created for the sake of woman, but woman for the sake of man. For this reason, a woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head. 
because of the angels. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man or man independent of woman. For just as woman came from man, so man comes through woman. But all things come from God. Judge for yourself. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head unveiled? Does not nature itself teach you, teach you that if a man wears long hair, it's degrading to him? But, a, but if a woman has long hair, it is her glory. For her hair is given to her as for a covering. But if anyone is disposed to be contentious, we have no such custom, nor do the churches of God. So here we go. Paul begins with a Christological statement. Christ is the head, source, authority of man. Men are the head, source, authority of woman. God is the head, source, authority of Christ. We cannot deny a certain hi hierarchical structure here. Christ to man, man to the woman, God to Christ. Yet there's also a certain logic, practical logic in it. After all, men were educated, were allowed to engage in social and public life beyond the domestic sphere of the home which, to which the women were limited. And it was the responsibility of the men to teach the women the things that pertain to God. Things learned from scripture, things talked about in public life. Now, in Corinth, some of the women were moving perhaps a bit precipitously into inspired, charismatic teaching and preaching. While Paul gives the freedom for such participation, he expects there to be some order as well. Thus, when he proposes that men should not have their long hair or should not have their hair long or their short hair covered up in church, he also says that women should have their long hair bound up and covered. This statement may be as ensuring, simple as ensuring certain gender identifications or Paul might simply be bowing to social customs. Remember, loose hair, ecstatic oracle speakers, loose women. Nevertheless, two affirmations must, must claim our attention. In verse 11, Paul suggests a mutual interdependence between men and women and a mutual accountability. And then, there is that hairstyle for men and a different hairstyle for women. Both genders are to participate fully according to their uniqueness. Men as men, women as women. But all things, including the gift of being male or the gift of being female, come from God. At the end of this section, you can tell that Paul is just getting too, too frustrated because he even trips over his own argument, saying that a woman's hair is her glory and it should be sufficient covering. And then he explodes with a statement that could probably be true, loosely translated as, and why are you being so contentious about this in the first place? It's not a rule for me. And it's certainly not a practice in our churches. Whatever was going on in Corinth gets under Paul's theological skin, and he's clearly a little bothered. However, it's the next section where Paul's botheredness really shines through. Paul turns now to a problem that grieves him severely, divisions within the church. 
Paul's complaint regarding the Christians' Corinth, uh, Corinth's conduct and worship including includes they've forgotten the purpose of their gathering to remember the death of Jesus, and they come when they come to share in the Lord's Supper. Some of the wealthy act as if this is a dinner party, and they are there only for their own delight, and thus they begin eating and drinking prior to the gathering of a full assembly. While some continue eating and drinking and becoming drunk, by the time the poor arrive, there is no food left. These likely servants and slaves who had to finish their work before they arrive come hoping for a meal that's been consumed by the rich. Let's read the text. This starts at the 17th verse and goes through the 22nd. Now in the following instructions, I do not commend you because when you come together, it is not for the better, but the worse. For to begin with, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and to some extent I believe it. Well, indeed, there have to be factions among you, for only so will it become clear who among you are genuine. But when you come together, it is not really to eat the Lord's Supper. For when the time comes to eat, each of you goes ahead with your own supper, and one goes hungry, and another becomes drunk. What? Do you not have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you show contempt of, for the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What should I say to you? Should I commend you? In this matter, I do not commend you. Paul is so angry that he shames the wealthy members. Now, that's not a very pastoral attitude. He suggests that maybe it would be better if they just stayed at home. If they can't wait for the whole body to arrive before beginning their, quote, dinner party. And then he accuses them of humiliating the poor, the very ones Jesus promised to be among. We should probably pause here and see how our self-absorption in worship might accidentally humiliate members of the congregation. What are our real desires and our real interests when we come to worship? Is it the person we're sitting next to? Or is it the lack of style of the individual a few rows up? Well, let's move on to section 3, verses 23 to 26. This is where Paul t t makes clear that the Lord's Supper is a proclamation of Jesus' death. He really puts, pulls together three aspects. Remembering Jesus' death proclaiming his new covenant, and anticipating his return. These words are extraordinarily familiar, but listen as if for the first time. For I, Paul, received from the Lord what I handed on to you, the church in Corinth, that the Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That trilogy of pulling together, remembering Jesus' death, proclaiming the new community, and anticipating his return, harkens back 
to the actual ritual of the Seder meal. The Seder meal, like any meal in a traditional Jewish household in the first century, began with the breaking of bread. And then as each guest took a piece of the bread and ate it, the host proclaimed peace around the table, that all had been united by sharing in this bread. At the end of the meal, occasionally, or in the Seder meal, the cup that was lifted up, the last cup of wine, was to give thanks and praise for the community that has been established, but also to ask a blessing that next year this Seder might be fulfilled in Jerusalem. The covenant uh, has been established during the meal, sealed in the cup, but with a prayer for next year in Jerusalem. Jesus flips all that into referencing his ministry, his life, his death, and his promised return. Let's conclude with 27 through 33. Paul offers an invitation now to the whole community, not to individuals within that community, but to the whole community. What is crucial is that they see one another as the collected body of Christ and that they conform their community life to the life of Jesus, which is a life that is shaped by a cross. Without discernment of Christ's way of life, his manner of death, and his hoped-for return, the community actually risks inviting God's judgment and discipline on it. In the end, Paul says to avoid this, it may be as simple as waiting for each other before you start to eat or taking a snack at home before the meal so that when the community assembles, it's an inclusive, helpful, loving unity of believers. Verses 27 through 33. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be answerable for the body and blood of the Lord. Examine yourselves and only then eat the bread and drink the cup. For all who eat and drink without discerning the body eat and drink judgment against themselves. For this reason, many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you come together to eat, wait for each other. If you are hungry, eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for your condemnation about other things. I will give you instructions when I come. This whole closing section is often heard as an indictment on unworthiness of individuals. But the passage is not directed towards individuals. It's directed towards the church as a whole. It is the duty of the church as a whole to discern Christ's body in the sacrament, but also in the community and in the hopes for the community. Paul has made it very clear to the Corinthians. Some of them are out of line, but it's not a problem to be dealt with individualistically. The community has to come together and help has to be restored there. Individuals can contribute to that healthiness, 
but it's not about individuals being worthy or unworthy. It is about the community exhibiting the life, death, and promised return of Jesus Christ. That's what Paul wants to accomplish as he institutes the Lord's meal. Now next week we move along to chapter 12, and that's the chapter in which Paul investigates spiritual gifts and their service and use within the community, especially the worshiping community. Once again, his goal is the strengthening of unity, and the lessons are grounded in building up and encouraging faith among all the members. Please enjoy chapter 12 as you prepare for next week. And until we study again, live peaceably with all.